Can you guys hear me? Can everybody see the slides? All right. Let me close some door. Uh, just slightly. Thank you. So, I'm. Thank you for coming. First of all, my name is Tomek, and uh, let me now treat you to my well-practiced Italian. Ciao. <laughs> Ciao, ragazzi. Uh, that would be the end of the Italian, except for the ciao at the end. Um, generally, uh, this is a presentation that came from me being uh, tortured with a number of discussions whether uh, FP is really good or really not, or it's something you should learn or you shouldn't, or it's too early. And in all those discussions, pretty much everybody kept saying the same things, and nobody had anything like data to back it up. So they, I decided to kind of start looking. So who am I? Uh, the first Google Photos, which are kind of scary apology, but these are the first Google Photos that are returned when you Google for me. And you might find me on Geekon, you might find me on Polish Java user group. Yes, I write in Java, don't kill me. Uh, I don't have a mortgage to pay, but I still want to eat. Uh, so I write in Java. Uh, I'm also one of the leaders for Polish Java user group and we are running a conference called Geekon. If you would ever actually want to spend some time in May to learn about JVM a great deal, that's the place actually to go to. Uh, I also attend Software Craftsmanship Kraków and this is a community which actually uh, been a big change in Krakow and also for me personally. Uh, this is the community which gets awesome t-shirts, like this one. Don't get blame my don't get blame me, I was per programming. This is from Cold Retreat. And why software craftsmanship is important here? Because without this community I wouldn't have read a number of papers which actually steered me to, towards functional programming. Uh, some of these papers will appear in like few more slides. Then finally there is the Lambda. And the Lambda Launch Krakow is something I really welcome you to if you will ever be in Krakow and would like to actually have a meeting, present something on the functional side, or just listen to something on the functional side, just drop me an email and I'll gladly oblige. So, full time I'm working on Cementis, uh, at Cementis, and if you would like to actually get in touch with me professionally, that also can happen. So, FP is awesome. Who ever has heard that line? Hands up. A number of people. You are in the right place, this functional conference. <laughs> so, uh, if you ever read the statements like those here, like for example, if you do not know FP, you're not a real programmer. Uh, my favorite answer to that is the XKCD comic that real programmers use Vim. No, they use Emacs. No, they use uh, some other editor. No, they use a needle and a steady hand. No, they use butterfly. How they use butterflies? Well, they open their hand, butterfly flaps their wings once, and the ripple it causes makes sunshine actually go to the uh, medium that you want and flip the beat that you want. And this butterfly is of course available in Emacs as a macro. <laughs> so, this is my favorite answer. Uh, the smartest programmers I know are functional programmers. This is actually something I have uh, I have the least gripe with from all the quotes that are flying around about how FP changes your life. So does it or does it not? Basically, FP changing your life being panacea to all problems is very old theme. It's something that is called the silver bullet. And if you read the works by Frederick Brooks, then you would know that he coined the term. And then later, in like two and a half pages, he completely destroyed it. So he said uh, that in medieval Europe we had werewolves, and werewolves were immune to pretty much everything, unless you had silver. So people came up with silver bullet as a means to actually deal with problems. So I have a software, and I need to write it on Friday, and it's Thursday. 
And my silver bullet will, of course, be such a great way of helping me that I'll manage to get it done. And yeah, pretty much you don't. So according to Brooks, there is no silver bullet. And I'll try to actually uh, give you some data and some food for thought whether FP can actually be one. So we're practically behind the part when I talk about myself. Now it's actually quite OK to talk about what it actually means when somebody says X is better. Better how? Better for what? The next thing is uh, the usual claims you hit and you hear about functional programming and the not so usual claims that you might have heard and I'll end up with a short summary why Bava. First of all, who here has read any of those three? Hands up. Okay. Which did you read? The first one, but... Mm-hmm. Okay. There was a hand up? Or my peripheral, my peripheral vision requires me to see a doctor? <laughs> okay, the doctor. So, why FP matters? Why functional programming matters by John Hughes. And uh, I got quite nervous when I submitted this talk to Lambda Days and I learned that John Hughes is on the program committee. I was like, ah, ha, ha, awkward. <laughs> Because pretty much uh, he attempted something, uh, something I did. Only he went about it from quite a different angle. He focused on composition. You heard Butters saying it. Progr programs are about composition and pretty much, as he said, category theory helps composition. Hughes has a somewhat broader claim. He actually reasons that functional programming allows you to construct programs in like a pipeline. Uh, whoever worked in GNU Linux or any other Nixes? So you do know about the pipe, right? It's this handy little utility that gives every Nix scripter a tremendous power without the great responsibility that Spider-Man has to worry about. So um, you actually use the utility, you pipe the output, it goes to the next utility that picks it up, then you pipe the output of the next utility, and you do the stream. And you can do pretty much the same with functions. Because if you have functional languages, that, that means that uh, functional languages, well, they have higher order functions or functions as first class citizens. That basically means that functions can take functions as arguments and their output can be piped to next function. So thus, it's the same as the pipe. And Hughes actually goes on to show how the modularity and uh, composition are really helpful when you program. That's what this paper is about. Can programming be liberated from the von Neumann style? It's a very nice paper by John Bacchus. John Bacchus, who's also famous for uh, Bacchus Naur notation, so you probably have heard the name. And what he actually says is that if you program, you usually program on the Turing machine, so basically von Neumann style. And an alternative functional style offers you advantage in terms of ability to prove that your program is actually correct. Well, if it's math, we can prove it. Basically, that's the reasoning that he has. Finally, we have the least known of all the least known of all the papers, and it's titled "Out of the Tarpit." Previously quoted Brooks, the one with the silver bullet and the werewolf, uh, he actually also coined, coined another term. He said that pretty much software business is in a tarpit. So you're writing a very messy code. You're really hurrying. You always have a deadline. There is always a customer who's angry and demanding. So with all that, you're actually really struggling to get the job done. And thus, when you hurry, you slip up. You don't actually pay enough attention to quality for it to be really something shiny. Thus, we're all in a tar pit. And we're des des desperately trying to find something that will help us out. So. Out of the Tarpit actually is a paper named in favor of that essay by Brooks. And they say that the way out of the Tarpit lies precisely within the hybrid of logic and functional programming. So something like 
uh, a mishmash between, say, Haskell and the Prolog. Whoever here codes in Erlang probably now has like, hmm, I perhaps have chosen a good language. Indeed, Erlang is kind of functional and it is kind of logical because Joe Armstrong was under the influence of both when he actually started creating it. So, out of the tarpit reasoning may be summarized as follows. First, we get uh, complexity. Whenever we deal with software, we have complexity. The more complexity we have, the tougher the problem we get, the more likely we get to make an error. After all, we're only human. So, complexity can be divided into two kinds of complexity. One is the essential. You can't actually avoid it. Your problem carries some level of complexity and that's pretty much it. That's the card you were given, that's the hand you were dealt. So you need to actually take care of it. The other part of the complexity, however, is accidental. It's, for example, uh, it comes from all the other problems. So say that I'm writing an email client. A simple job to do. And when I write this email client, my complexity is that of an email client. I need to actually be able to send emails, get emails, uh, follow the protocols for emails, all that stuff. Nothing really tough. However, let now say that I'm given only a ZX Spectrum computer. Whoever had one of those, hands up. Oh, I like you guys. Did you also uh, use the pencil to actually rewind the tapes? Yeah, I see nodding. Yeah, I did that too. So, uh, basically, when you have that, you have accidental complexity. Had I been given a real proper tool for the job, had I been given access to some sort of better programming languages than those that were available at ZX Spectrum Basic, <coughs> basic uh, then I could do the job better. Had I been given, say, some sort of library that already actually follows the protocols, cool. Unfortunately, if this library follows the protocols for email and a number of other protocols, then I can get to actually, I can actually have higher accidental complexity than I want. So accidental complexity is something that comes from the tools you use, from the programs you actually have to bother, from other problems that you might actually need to take care of. For example, accidental complexity for my friend who's working for a Swiss bank is the fact that he cannot take a look at production. Never, ever. He cannot get the logs from production. So whenever something crashes, he gets like three lines of logs. After two approvals from his manager and the other manager. That is accidental complexity. And Accidental complexity in pretty much everything when it comes to programming comes from state. When you have a state, you have a problem. When you mutate state, you have a problem. When you actually share state, you have even bigger problem. So this is what people who wrote out of the top, it said. Sources for accidental mutation come from unwanted mutations of the state, from unpredicted state sharing from those things that you actually didn't anticipate when you started creating your programs and base it around some state. So they claim that functional programming with pipes can bypass state altogether. With immutability it can bypass mutation altogether, all that. And they ended up saying that with logic and inference and actually uh, reasoning based from what you had previously calculated, you can get pretty far, Automa automatically, and without error. So, both these claims are fairly logical and you would be hard pressed to actually argue against them. So, all these papers is something that when you want to have a real discussion about functional programming merits or actually the otherwise, I suggest you to read first. Now this is still work in progress as I have found a number of leads and when I was actually telling this presentation in other places I also got people to come to me and say some nice things about things I have found or things I haven't found. So thus uh, there will be a GitHub article and the GitHub article will be something that I welcome your contributions to. 
So whenever you'll have actually leads or things you would see, you would think that they are actually in error or whatnot, just let me know and I'll gladly amend the work or just accept your pull request. So I promised you to tell what is better. So there is a number of cases when you hear that language X is better than language Y, whichever X and Y would be. And uh, my question is actually, who here has ever read white paper on any language that you write in? Like why the language has come to exist? What was the language? And what was the white paper saying about it? So his white paper is actually my first white, pa white paper on the language. It's white paper on Java. Nice to meet you. And uh, basically it said, um, for a white paper that was my first, I really didn't expect it to be so much market speak. Like, Java is really the best language you can get because, and here goes the market speak. So I was like, uh, are all white papers like that? It's kind of hmm, edgy. And most of them are. When you actually want to take a look at why language was created, you should look at something else, like design notes or design discussions, things like that. And with that, after you read it, a whole new world actually opens, like why this language came to exist. And usually the answer is because author had a problem. If I have a problem, I usually go and try to create something that will solve the problem. That's pretty much all we do, we're programmers. We have a theory for the problem, we apply this theory and codes come to exist. And pretty much that's the same for languages. So Erlang people, Joe Armstrong and his team, they wanted a language that would actually work for telecommunications and be totally, and I mean totally resilient. They wanted something that would crash and burn and still get the job done because they subscribe to a very good belief that network is fallible, bandwidth is finite, and pretty much everything that can go wrong sooner or later will. So that's how actually Erlang came to be. And you can go around about number of languages and that's pretty much the same. They had a reason for coming to existence. JavaScript was actually started as a, a simple scripting for the browser. So Eich actually created JavaScript because Netscape people wanted to have something that would interpret simple code. And that was it. And with this in mind, better means something you want. Better means that your problem as closely resembles the problem of author of the language as possible. Because if it does, then the language will support you in getting your job done. If it doesn't, then sorry, no cookie. The usual claims about functional is, for example, that it's the future, the next big thing, that it changes your thinking, it actually uh, opens a new horizon, all that. Yeah, market speak, I know. Uh, it leads to shorter and tester code, thus the better code. It also has, gives you more power. Functional programmers have actually better abstractions and can, can reuse their code better. It, has less complexity because it avoids state mutation. It has streams, so better function composition and no side effects. Um, it can be re reliable. You can really write reliable software because you can prove that it's really the software that you wanted to write. After all, it's math. And finally, it's better tool for concurrency or multi-core problem. Anything to add to the list? Any claim that you heard and I haven't listed? So it pretty much sums it up nicely, right? Okay, at least three people nodded. The rest probably is too scared to nod. Am I that scary? So the future, the next big thing. First of all, let's define future. What is the future? What can we say about trends? Like, take a look at the past. 
when assembly was introduced, when Fortran was introduced, when higher level languages were actually coming to existence in like multiple shapes and, and shades, how could we tell based from past and now what is the future? So when I thought about it, I came with following criteria. By fame, who heard about the X, the next big thing? How often have you heard about it? Are there conferences that are actually geared toward it? Are there languages that actually exploit it? Are there uh, some sign of adoption, say, in the market? Companies offering jobs using, say, X, whatever the X is. So those were my criteria. Fill in with yours if you have any other and any better. And let's see what I found. Well, conferences. Hello, LambdaCon. Now, what kind of conference would it be? And there is also Lambda Days, which uh, in Poland is like actually quite famous. Well, not only in Poland. And it has like two editions right now. And yeah, it's also functional oriented. Well, there are other conferences, which are pretty much all quite young. Now, have you ever heard of Strange Loop? Ah, nice. So Strange Loop, uh, which seemed to be mm, much less heard about than here, uh, whenever I was previously, uh, Strange Loop is a very nice conference, very advanced, and it has a really nice side event. It's called Emerging Languages Camp. So when you're actually creating the, the language, programming language, you can go to Strange Loop and say, I have this language, it's called X, and it's really nice because, and I would like to talk about it. And during the emer Emerging Languages camp, you will meet others like you. And in my opinion, it takes the guts, the goal, and the brain to create a programming language, even as a, say, pet project. So people there are really interesting. And all kinds of functional languages can be seen there as emerging in like last few years, if you take a look at their agenda. You would really see that a number of people actually have written a sort of functional language, quasi-functional language, or a functional language. So yeah, popularity up. You can see articles about functional programming. You can see it in, even in mainstream portals or ma magazines. So by fame, definitely, it's on the rise. By practicality. So I took a look at the market share who uh, uses functional programming. Uh, what kind of domains are famed for using it. And to be honest, I don't have much data here. I would subscribe it to actually three things. Uh, one, if you believe that technology X offers you some competitive advantage, you will not gladly share that information outside. So say I have a startup and I'm having really good prospects and it's all thanks to this nice functional language, say, f -sharp. I wouldn't actually want to go around and say, wow, f made made my, made my company. Because pretty much everybody else could actually do the same. So job offers, that's what I took a look at, and uh, I'll show it in a while. Adoption level in other popular languages, yeah, by God, of course. Java 8 has lambdas, which was supposed to appear even in Java 7. Uh, C++ has uh, functional concept streaming in since like specification 2011. Chash, the same thing. Uh, Python actually got closures some time ago. Uh, JVM actually allowed with JVM starting from Java 7 actually allows a number of languages to use dynamic invocation. And those languages pretty much often they are functional. Uh, the Geekon conference had a nice uh, t-shirt like two years ago which showed a number of projects on the JVM as the UFO. So there were various kinds of UFOs, and two I learned, for example, that there is a Haskell on JVM, purely functional. And to be honest, if we take a look even at SQL, one of the oldest languages around, you will see that a number of functional concepts are employed there. So adoption level in the languages, certainly. I also took a look at the popularity of the languages, and as you, as you can see, there is one language that actually tops pretty much every other functionals. Be it Lisp, Haskell, 
F sharp, closure, Erlang, they all cannot hold the candle to this one very language. So how do you think? Is Scala really something that every programmer should know? Ah, there was some, yeah, in the background. <laughs> okay. Unfortunately, if we put it in context, like take a look at how Java is popular and how C is popular, then you can see that, yeah, this, this almost flat line, this is all functional languages in comparison, yeah? So, not looking so great. And to be honest, which is, uh, those two languages, they really steal the show. If you added Ruby, which I wanted to actually add to see how it fares in comparison, uh, you can see that it's kind of on the decline, but still going well. Why I've added Ruby is because GitHub started as a Ruby-centered thing. So pretty much if you were a Rubyist when GitHub started, you would have your repositories on the GitHub. Pretty much every Ruby gem landed there. And at some point, GitHub actually rose in prominence, and now a number of studies actually are trying to see whether functional programming matters by seeing, uh, like, if GitHub functional repositories has more or less issues than non-functional ones. Now, the problem with what is a functional repository on GitHub can be nicely illuminated with this graph on the left, my left, your right. So, you can see that Ruby here took a sharp decline. And if you actually think that this is because Ruby sucks or started sucking or actually, I don't know, uh, whatever was there, it started not sucking so much that people from Ruby switched, then whatever it was, it actually it's not that. The problem is that here is the beginning of GitHub and here is the time when GitHub got popular. So pretty much here, people from all kinds of trades and languages started appearing on GitHub. So this isn't about Ruby declining in popularity, it's about other languages rising. And thus, if you would like to actually take a look at what's in GitHub, mm, not really. The other reason, JavaScript. The number of active repositories, the number of new repositories in GitHub, JavaScript is the most prominent language. We should drop whatever we're doing. Stop coming to LambdaCon. Go learn JavaScript. The problem is only one. If you actually have created a hello world in HTML, and for some reason you used, say, uh, some template from the net, and the template had script jQuery in it, so you actually pulled jQuery even though you haven't used it. So by number of lines of code you have, your repository just get classified as a JavaScript one. So this is the problem with GitHub. But if you really would like to play and verify all my claims, then GitHub info is the, is the place to go. They have awesome API to actually mine the GitHub, and they use the GitHub own API to mine them. Really nice and with lots of graph. So GitHub failed me as a source of data. So I went around and looked further and I found TOB. Who here knows what TOB is? A number of hands. How long have you known what TOB is? Half a year? How long have you known what TOB is? Two years, three years. Ah. Those with two years and three years are pretty much older than I am with knowing what TIOB is. Uh, TIOB is a very nice place to actually gauge what uh, languages are popular and not. How it works. They have a number of trends if you go to them. And this includes like uh, data from back from 1985. So yeah, a kind of long term. What I looked was top 50 languages and mm, some functional languages that I like. down the line, like 36. Uh, from the top 10, you could argue that some of them are functional. After all, Java has lambdas, right? 
write, you can write functional code in C++. JavaScript is a hybrid language, multi-paradigm one, right? You can write functional programs in JavaScript. But even with all that, the first purely functional language that is on the list is number 14 F sharp. So not really that great. Uh, I'll skip how TOB works because my time is slowly running out. Let's just say that they have really solid way of getting the information, which includes actually uh, 25 different search engines and a number of hits for the very simple query. <laughs> Programming, where <laughs> can be Java, F -sharp, Python, Lisp and whatever. So they are looking at that. Uh, F sharp is the only programming language which, language which actually made it higher than the 1% of the ratings. And let's be honest, 30% uh, of all the results for all the <laughs> programming that TOB has found is either Java or C. These two languages are reigning supreme and I don't think anything will tackle them in the next few years. So summarizing, functional programming is definitely on the rise. It's definitely getting more traction and it's becoming more famous. It's becoming more uh, useful and unfortunately that's that. Dominating uh, market share greatest? No, not really, not yet, not at this point in time. So is it really expanding your horizons, making you a better programmer and what not? Yeah, certainly, it's another tool that you can have at your disposal. It shapes your thinking, it allows you to think in another way. And this is the general truth. So take anybody who's actually amounted to something in his field, be it, say, swordsmanship, like Miyamoto Musashi, or be it like astronomy, like Mikołaj Kopernik, or be it chemic chemistry, like, say, uh, Marie Curie Skłodowska. Pretty much everybody if you take famous people, intelligent people, genius people, they did something out of their own field because it actually helped them get better. So, yeah. Uh, one minor thing here. If you learn Haskell and then go back to your job in, say, C Hash or C++ or Java, it will hurt you because you will not be able to employ all the Haskell goodies. Whether it is shorter and tester code is something that pretty much every tutorial on the web uh, makes a point of. Use my language because it's functional and you can actually, I, you see here I have this example when I have a code and in imperative programming you would need two for loops and one li while and perhaps an if. So take a look at how it can be done in my language and it's like six lines of codes, no whiles, no for loops. This is awesome, right? Well, uh, who here actually tries to write the Tessa code, the most shortest code that is ever possible? Yeah, as I thought, pretty much nobody raises the hand on this question. So it's not really a good criteria. If you heard of APL, this is a language which leads to the most short code and yeah, it requires its own keyboard because of all the symbols that can have different meaning if the preceding symbol is that or the other. More power. Mm, sometimes, I would say sometimes. Uh, Paul Graham had this really awesome blue paradox, which actually, blah paradox, which actually uh, ties with making you think differently. We can all agree that progr programming languages vary in power, say, uh, C in original version was weaker language than C in now current version. Same with Java, same with number of versions of languages. Pretty much new version of language usually is the more, more powerful. So if we can actually place on the power axis languages and they differ, then what if we had this hypothetical language blob? So let's say it's right in the middle. It's after all hypothetical, right? So I'm a hypothetical blob programmer and I take a look down the power line and I see, ah, those languages suck. They don't have this or that feature which I like in blob. 
Blob is better than those languages because it's just, well, it has those features. Now, what do I see if I look up? I see weird languages. I see strange languages which I actually do not like working in. I don't want to work in them. They are out of my comfort zone. So, the experience uh, probably tells you that it's kind of right. Graham likes to add here that at the top of the axis is one language with lots of parentheses. So less bugs. Complexity, accidental, essential, we've been through this. Mutation, immutability, referential transparency, which gives us uh, little side effects or no side effects. Papers that have nice reasonings about this, yes hard data to back it up, like an experiment, study, which can be replicated and you can actually take a look at the data. No. At least I found none. You can reason about it. Pretty much what, what, uh, John, uh, what John Bacchus claimed. But you can reason about programs, you can prove them, you can use algebra. Pretty much you won't. Because let's face it, proving a program is fairly difficult. There is, of course, a math for it, but the math requires a human. You can't actually program a program to reason about a program. What you can do is to program a program to offer you part of reasoning, then have a human take a look at it, calculate something, and push the program on. So that's pretty much the best we can do right now. There are places when, it, when we can reason about some programs and we can infer some things of them and pretty much functional programming, programming languages like Haskell are using the inference to do absolutely wonderful things to actually reason about the types. But that's not the same as proving that your program is actually a web server or it conforms to HTTP protocol. Well, HTTP, okay, that's simple protocol, but take something more serious. and you'll be hard-pressed to prove it. Uh, for sake of example, quicksort. How do you think how long it took for her to actually prove that quicksort works? That it really sorts? Try to guess. How long it took him? Six months. Close, but make it years. He needed years to actually prove that the quicksort program worked. He actually had to develop the algebra for it. So no, it's no, not an easy matter to prove that your program works, to actually offer a mathematical proof on the program. So take my word for it. You won't really do it within the next few years because the algebra right now doesn't allow it. At least not for commercial program. It's just the cost is just too big. Whoever thinks that your boss would actually say, yeah, go ahead, develop the algebra to prove that your program works. Right? Source multicore problem. Well, immutability, less state, less deadlocks, uh, referential transparency, so no side effects, no, sti no state sharing. It has all the mechanism to support this. To solve, really solve multicore problem, we shall see down the line. Erlang had some sort of studies done and they've seen what it can do, but this is just Erlang's data. So whatever it says, we need to take it with a grain of salt. After all, I doubt that they would publish data that would say Erlang totally sucks, don't use it. So again, papers yet, yes, studies, no, except for the Erlang ones so far. I haven't found anything yet that would prove that functional languages help concurrency. To be honest, I really believe that Erlang actually helps concurrency. After all, come on. Would financial and telecommunications sectors use it so frequently? Nah, wouldn't, wouldn't happen. Um, unusual claims is the hybrid approaches, which actually, beside the paper out of the top, I found nothing interesting. And how good OOP works actually quite similar to FP. And if you've taken a look at the, uh, if you've take a look, taken a look at Smalltalk, uh, you could see that essentially, OOP and FP are pretty much about the same. It's about message passing. It's about actually communicating with other program without letting it know what you're doing. So, whenever you're up, 
and against anyone who would like to debate FP with you, or like uh, Asian people would say, I would like to discuss FP programming with Master Lee. And then the Vuxia happens. Yeah. So whenever this happens in your life, uh, I would say that you have a couple of arguments you can safely use. Concurrency, complexity, sure, absolutely. You can back with data the think about proving programs. It sometimes works, it works in some fashions, and there is a number of things you can do. There is, for example, Yoneda Lemma, which is helpful in actually substituting one program with another because of actual mat mathematical proof. So there are limited appliances of this right now, and they are pretty much used like in languages like Haskell. So, yeah. You can back it some, some with data, but on a global scale, no. What you can argue, you can argue expressiveness, but please do let the other person experience it rather than forcing it down their throat. Like, I tell you, Lisp is better. If they actually resist you then, uh, I can't say I haven't warned you. So it gives you another thinking, yeah, sure, it does. Uh, you can argue this, but again, it's better that the other person experiences this for themselves because, well, this makes them convince much, much faster. Uh, if you want to actually discuss market share, popularity, and uh, test the code, and whether popular means better, uh, don't go there. You'll lose. And one last thing. If you were asked for my opinion, I see that, yeah, concurrency, less state, after all, sometimes state is needed. Uh, it makes you into a better programmer, and streams make for a better thought flow when you try to compose programs. Anyway, if I were to say why bother, I would answer with you tell me. Because it's, after all, your case and your programming. Thank you very much. So, any question? Shoot. Uh, you want to learn functional concepts or solve some real problems? Go with Haskell. You can't go wrong with Haskell. It has nice, uh, nice learning curve, a uh, number of things to actually help you speed up the learning process. Scala is also quite a good choice. Sorry? Oh. <laughs> uh, a number of people would say yes. Okay. Hello? Uh, perhaps like that it would be sufficient. Uh, a number of people would say Now I have no choice. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so a number of people I know and really admire, they are Lispers. And they really stuck it through um, pretty much everything. Lisp, Lisp is the only functional language that ever made it to the top three in the TOB index. Granted, it was like 80s, but still it did. Uh, Lisp is also the base for pretty much a number of functional languages. So, uh, the only thing I would actually say might discourage you is first, some people really take some time to actually start ignoring the parentheses. And yeah, totally, I, I coded with Lispers and they are like, they don't see them. It's like half of their screen gets filtered out. I don't know how they do it, but they don't see the parentheses. Uh, and the other thing would be that uh, uh, it's not really something modern. On the other hand, Lisp is the only language that I know that has the rest outs. And they used it when they sent the probe to Neptune. The probe actually had a bug, and they discovered it when the probe was midway. So they actually radioed to the probe. They restarted the program, and they coded live on the probe and changed the programming. How cool is that? I have a special test 
to um, evaluate uh, how new languages that I study work. And uh, the idea comes from, uh, if I remember correctly, from Donald Nutt, who um, had uh, a quote uh, that says that uh, it was nice to learn Python, it was a nice afternoon. I don't know if uh, if everybody knows about it, and uh, it's al um, always for me a test that works. But because uh, uh, when you can um, uh, get a language, study for one day, one afternoon, and get uh, an idea of uh, what it, uh, what's the problem that the author has in mind, I think that uh, that language is a good match for you. In many cases, uh, if it takes too much. Uh, to learn the language, it means that maybe the problems you have and the problems that you are going to solve are far away from the problems of the author, and so you can't find the connection, you can't make the click. Mm -hmm. This could be related uh, then to the productivity. You haven't spoken about productivity. What do you think uh, could be a good measure, uh, instead of this uh, stupid test, uh, to measure productivity when you approach a new language? Actually, what you said is Put on. Basically, when you actually are adopting a new language for a problem, if it speeds up, if you click with it fast, yeah, that's a productive language for the problem. If you have tools actually that solve you, help you solve problems, if there are libraries that actually are dealing with, say, data mining and you're in data mining, awesome. But we don't have much time, so thank you, Tomek. Thank you.